Phew. So that deriving the equation for the electromagnetic wave is probably one of the worst um, toughest derivation we'll be doing all term. Now this one coming up for sound, it's about just as bad, if not a little worse. So if you're trying to march right on through, I would highly recommend you taking a short break now. But if you've done that already, go right ahead and jump right on in. Now that we've finished deriving the wave equation for the, for the EM wave, let's move towards the sound wave. Sound wave, as you understand them, is a longitudinal pressure wave. So here you can see we press a bunch of air together, which clumps together, then relaxes, clumps together and relax. And that kind of forms its waves that propagate, say, from a speaker all the way to our ear. Similar to how the EM way works, changing E, giving you changing B, changing B, giving you changing E. Sound wave works kind of the same way, except there are three variables to be working with here. First, gas moves. And they move, they clump together, and they change the density. And then, a change in density will give you a change in pressure. Because, as you imagine, the more dense a pocket of gas is, the harder it pushes back out. And then, these pressure inequalities in different spots creates an unbalanced force, F equals MA, and you get motion. And so, you have your gas position moving, giving you different density, Different density gives you different pressure. Different pressure gives you different motion. And that's a loop. So there are three things we're relating instead of the two we do in EM wave. And we make an assumption here to make our math, I guess, doable. To be able to make a lot of linear approximations. We assume that the change in density and pressure is small relative to the background or the average density of and pressure. So we're not dealing with things like a sonic boom or a big giant explosions. Again, to make our lives easier, we're going to confine ourselves to the plane waves. In this context, the plane wave talks about how the, the sound travels in a particular direction. In this direction, say we call X, and in terms of the plane wave, we have these planes of air and that each plane has a certain pressure that only depends on its x position and time. And also the density is doing the same thing and the velocity is also doing the same thing. Additionally, the velocity is only in the x direction moving longitudinally in the x-direction back and forth. The first order of business is then we have to relate our pressure with our density. Now we can start by breaking down our pressure into two components. Basically one part where it is the background or average pressure and some change away from that. And of course the average and background it's the same throughout space and time. And then the change itself is the part that depends on x and t. The assumption here, of course, is that this change is much, much smaller than the average. Very similarly, we can write the same thing for density, which has some kind of average density and some kind of change away from that average. Now, we don't quite know how pressure relates to density. So we'll keep it general and say pressure is some function of the density. So breaking this down into the average and change component, we have PO plus P delta is equal to some function of rho O plus rho delta. As the delta is small, we can use Taylor series expansion or linear approximation. So this is going to be whatever the function evaluates to at the average density plus a little change in our density times the derivative of the function at rho zero. And of course, 
this part is the same as this part because that's just the background density giving you the background pressure, we end up with P delta, low change in pressure, is equal to the derivative at rho naught times rho delta. And notice this doesn't depend on x or t, so it's just a constant. And we'll define that constant to be k. To stress that one again, that's dp d rho when the pressure is equal to p naught or when the rho is equal to rho naught. And that's the first step where we can say the little change in pressure is directly proportional to the little bit of change in density. Second step, we have to talk about how the movement or displacement of air give rise to density changes. So here we have to draw an air packet. At this time, there's no disturbance or anything, so everything's nice and calm, in equilibrium. So it is at the original average density. And then later on, we send a disturbance through it. And as a result, the air packet moves. And the front edge and the back edge moves by a different amount. So let's draw that in. So here we have, for displacement, we'll use this lovely letter, chi, I believe. Uh, so that's at x and t. And here we have chi at x plus delta x and t. And these are different. And as a result of the front edge and back edge moving different amounts, the volume of our air packet has changed. And therefore, that will change the density as well. So the size of this packet is going to be given by the original length plus the difference between the two displacement here. T minus X and T there. Excuse me for the mess. Now, as we put out the x to be small, since we're considering a very small air packet, we can once again use linear approximation or Taylor series expansion, as you will, to bring out this partial derivative. Then, because the mass is conserved, we can write the mass before the disturbance came along. It's equal to the mass after and whereas before the mass was a delta x, which was the original volume, times the original density. And then later you have a times delta x plus di chi di x delta x times a different density canceling a and delta x from both sides, we end up with rho naught is equal to rho naught plus rho delta times 1 plus di chi di x. Then, as we expand, we'll get rho naught is equal to rho naught plus rho naught di chi di x plus rho delta plus rho delta di chi di x. Moving the change in density onto the other side, we get negative rho naught di chi di x minus rho delta di chi di x. And of course, saying that rho delta is much, much smaller than the average, we'll cross out this term and we end up with this, which tells you the change in density is related to how fast the different edges are moving differently from each other, which tends to make sense. And the negative sign tells you that 
if the front edge move faster than the back edge, you get decreasing in density and vice versa, which also makes sense. Step number three is going to involve relating pressure to any motion that we have. Now, this is actually not that hard since we're talking about motion, we're talking about Newton's second law, F equals ma, and the body we're considering here is a pocket of air that has a width of delta x. On the one side, it's going to feel a pressure of P of x. Technically, there's a time dependence as well. And on the other side, you have the pressure at x plus delta x and time. Summing up forces, pressure times area gets you a force, pxt minus px plus delta xt is equal to ma. And ma we can expand a little bit more. Once again, with a couple approximations, first off, we're going to say that because our change in density is much, much smaller than the background, we'll just approximate the mass as having the background density. And then second of all, because we're going to assume our delta x to be infinitesimally small as we take the limit, that the difference in displacement between the front edge and the back edge is going to be negligible. So the actual movement of the packet is going to be the second derivative of the displacement at the x itself. On this side, once again, we have our partial derivative because delta x is small, giving us di p di x, but negative because the plus delta x is in the second term times delta x. Cross, cross, clean that up a little bit. Taking out the delta x as well, we are left with di p di x negative is equal to rho naught, di chi square di p square. And this p here, only the delta part of it depends on x. So we can introduce a delta here as well. And then this is what you end up with, and that relates your pressure difference with your motion. Collect the nice results from each of the three steps. Step one, we got how the change in pressure is directly proportional to the change in density. Second step, change in density, we related that with the um, displacement changes over space. And it's combining these three equations that we can get the wave equations for the density, the pressure, and the displacement. So let's do it for the case for the displacement. Here, we combine these two to get the change in pressure is given by negative k rho naught di chi di x. And then to put it into the differential equation, we take the spatial derivative. Hey, second derivative, we're almost there. Negative and negative goes away. And so we have rho di square chi di x square is equal to rho naught di chi di t squared, second derivative, second derivative. And that goes away. And once again, we have our wave equation and we know that this guy is our phase velocity squared. And that was the wave equation for the displacement. But if we go about in a slightly different order, we can generate a similar wave equation for the density or the pressure. And I'll leave that up to you. But what you would ultimately get is that all three things, the density, the pressure, and the displacement, all falls within a wave equation, all with the same phase velocity. So everything goes along at the same speed, which is kind of cool. And then now we can, once we have our k, we can work out the actual phase speed of this wave.